Do you um, press it when on the PowerPoint? If you press Control and left click, laser pointer automatically pops up. Oh, I that's good. I mean, for the ones for if I, I yeah, about. yeah, cover. That's good. thank you. Uh, you don't need it. And don't yeah, do that. Works. Yeah. Yeah. Something may happen. <laughs> All right, let's get started uh, for the first uh, seminar of the semester. We've got a, a, an interesting uh, lineup uh, for you uh, for the next uh, few weeks. We're going to have a series of speakers uh, from uh, various parts of uh, the country uh, talking about uh, different subjects. I hope uh, you'll find them interesting. But today's talk, uh, we've invited uh, Professor Silvio Baldino, the latest addition to our uh, faculty here at MSPE. For those of you that don't know, uh, Silvio earned a bachelor's degree and a master's degree from the Polytechnic uh, University in Milan. Uh, I've been there uh, before and I'll take any chance I can to, to <laughs> visit uh, Milan. Very, very uh, uh, nice place. Um, he also received his PhD degree here at TU in our program. Uh, he, after TU, he worked with uh, Shell and Cognite uh, on exciting topics. Um, he's uh, perhaps, you know, younger than some of our faculty, the older ones, the old farts. I consider myself young too. Uh, so he knows a lot about uh, he knows a lot about things uh, like digitalization and uh, you know I I can't even pronounce it right. Digitization, digitalization, digitalization. Right? With an L. <laughs> anyway, without uh, further embar self embarrassment, uh, so all yours. Thank you, Dr. Yunis, and uh, hello everyone. Thanks for uh, coming to this first graduate seminar of 2022. I'm glad to be opening this series. So thanks again for the invitation. And today, I hope we will talk about something that may be of interest for most of you, even though it may seem like drilling related. The vast majority of the concepts we will cover today, which again is in a general basis, but they are very much applicable to all the oil and gas uh, world. It's basically equally the same concept applies for production and reservoir as well. So the, con the topic of today's talk is basically how real-time drilling data can help us as domain expert, uh, since we have an engineering degree from petroleum engineering, how this can help us uh, contribute to improve the best practices of our industry. These are the main topi topics we will go through. The first one will be just basically an overview of basically why do we need real-time data, specifically for drilling, but again, this applies for other uh, topics as well. What are the challenges that this data bring with themselves and where they can add value? Now, 20 years ago, we can say that we were in the oil era. And that's, that was true because the most valuable assets were oil and gas. Right now, it's not, not so much. Although oil and gas represents still the main and preferred uh, source of uh, natural resources to produce <clears throat> energy, they would be still a very valuable assets in the measure that we can produce them and uh, convert them to energy in a sustainable way. And how do we help our industry to be more sustainable? One of the main uh, helpers, one of the main passages we need to go through is what the industry calls the digital transformation. But why this is important? It's because one thing that the oil industry produces more than natural, oil, natural gas and oil is data. We have a sheer volume of data, but data are useful only if we can make sense out of them. And once we do, then there is a tremendous value in those data. Trust me, you have no idea how many data we can gather in basically in the past 30, 40 years. It's, it's ridiculous. It's so much value. The only thing is how do we get it? How do we extract it? And that's why, whether we like it or not, we enter the data era. Because right now, the most valuable asset is data. And so let's try to get advantage of it. Even if our background is not computer science, mine is not. But yet, I do want to try to understand the concept behind so that I can make the best 
use of the newest technology or the best practices and be part of the digital transformation. Because the secret of being part, being part of the change is to contribute to it, otherwise you will be left behind. And so in this uh, contest, we will see how real-time data, specific to drilling, but again, this can be applied to any other sort of data, is handled through this new standard, new quote-unquote, it's been now out for about 20 plus years, but we will see what it took to get there. And this is the WixML standard. WixML stands for Well Information Transfer System or Transfer Service Markup Language. And we will see how this standard helped the industry uh, to exchange data across all the line of businesses, across multiple applications, across all the actors of the well delivery workflow, which are extremely high in number. We will see what are the standards associated with this, the schemas, and how the data flow looks like. And again, in a general way, this is not a computer science seminar, and I'm not the right person to give you one of those seminars. But I can give you the general concept and how to approach this. And finally, we will see how, as engineers, we can make use of this data. And I'll show you two main applications, which are more specific to drilling. So as I mentioned, the well delivery, the well delivery workflow is extremely convoluted. There are so many parties involved. And it's not just drilling a hole in the ground. It starts with GNG geological and geophysical analysis. We need this data to carry on the well planning, which right now everything, of course, is done digitally as of now. We don't do this anymore on paper. So everything you see here is done digitally. But ideally, we should see a flow of data throughout this uh, workflow sections but this doesn't actually happen just yet, but we can work through it. So as I mentioned, there are multiple parties involved in the well-delivered world. So GNG, geological and geophysical analysis, provides the information to do the well planning, which involves, of course, all sorts of trajectory planning, casing and tubing design, blow-up simulations, and all other sorts of designs or pre-designs that we need to do to start building up our drill plan. Once the planning is done, we need to start doing all sorts of like procurement and logistic accommodations. And then we put down the best practices for safety and efficiency of the drilling process. And then we start drilling the hole. Now, this is where real-time data comes to play a big role. So while we drill, as of now, we are able to gather real-time data with extremely small latency. And if we have a way to make all these parties involved access this data, in a uh, vendor slash operator slash application agnostic way, meaning that regardless of who is involved, I can access those data by just tapping into the server because I know the standards that are behind those data. I know the schemas associated with each data type. Then you understand how all of these parties will benefit from it. Because imagine we are drilling, we real time measure inclination and azimuth, and we see that we are deviating in an unacceptable way from the planned trajectory. So what do we do? We need to take actions. But why this is happening? Perhaps we are uh, basically uh, having a higher deep angle of deformation. So perhaps the GNG analysis should be carried out again to take care of that. And the output from here should change the planning, which basically will reflect on all the other steps. And then again, we can resume drilling and do corrective actions. This is ideally how it should work. The problem is, unfortunately, is that even though we optimize the communication between the parties involved in the drilling operations, we are still struggling to liberate the data and have all the other parties involved accessing them. So that's why there is still work to do, but we can contribute to this change and make data really liberated so that everyone can access them at any time, so that we can actually really improve the drilling process and make it more efficient and definitely more sustainable. And again, it is only if we make our industry sustainable that we will make it competitive with any other sorts of quote unquote green uh, energy or renewable energy system, which of course cannot provide the same energy outcome at the same price that we know that already, but we need to improve the way we do our business. That's for sure. And of course this, I forgot to start the animation where I went through all of these parties. So where real time data can help I mentioned already it can help across all sorts of steps of the well delivery, but in drilling, in actual drilling operations. NPDs 
can be as high as 25% of the drilling time, which is an outrageous amount of time, especially if you consider how much it costs to perform to drill a deep water well, for example, in the Gulf of Mexico or in the North. You can only imagine if you have to spend extra 25% in basically sitting idle and figuring out what's wrong. For example, say you are having a stuck pipe. How real-time data can help you? Well, when you have a stuck pipe, what you do is you start playing with tension, basically hook load and torque, try to unstuck the pipe. But if we do play too much with these two uh, uh, variables, you may actually cause catastrophic failure of the drill stream. So how real-time data can help is if you have a way to real-time measure the combined load on the drill stream by plotting hook load and torque on a combined load chart, then you know exactly until when you can uh, push the limits to still be in the design, in the safety design zone. You can even push it towards the critical zone as long as you don't go into the failure zone. And in this way, you have a knowledge of what you're doing. You can hopefully unstuck the pipe much faster and you can avoid actually catastrophic failure of the pipe. And if that happens, you may actually even want to have to drill a side track, which is again, a huge amount of money that you will be wasting. And I can tell you, this is actually a process that is in place in one of the major operators. Real-time data are far reaching, as I mentioned, since there is a standard uh, nowadays to read and write this data, everybody involved in drilling can access them, whether you are on a rig or on the onshore facility or in the Houston office if you're drilling in the Gulf. So it doesn't matter where you are, you can always uh, monitor real-time what's going on. And I did monitor my first share wells at 4 a.m. It's literally at my home in Houston because I could, because I had direct access to the uh, with some server. If you have more people accessing the data, you need less personnel on the reef, which in turn reduce the cost and the safety uh, exposures on the risk, risk of safety exposures. Of course, having data continuously monitored will basically provide you more standardized and repeatable operations because you can monitor everything. You can take faster decisions. And again, you can continuously monitor everything that is happening in real time. And insights from real time data can provide feedbacks and most importantly, warnings to the drillers. Like, again, there are multiple things we monitor. One of them is, for example, the heat generator, if there is any contact between casing and drill stream. We have ways to estimate that. And what if we are rotating too fast? Then a real-time system can actually trigger an alarm and say, okay, start reducing your RPM or increase your circulation because you are overheating the casing. And if that happens, we will see actually one of the examples. You may cause thermal stresses and potentially you may damage the casing. And once the casing is damaged and is leaking, it's actually game over. There are multiple ones that have to be abandoned because of casing damage. And eventually, visualizing is always the key in reducing risk and targeting uh, uh, high-risk situations. And visualization always helps. And you can do that if you can actually have this data all the time in a standard way, and you can process them and visualize them real time. Now, the challenges with drilling data, as I mentioned, is that there are numerous parties involved. And each of these parties, whether they are operators, vendors, contractors, Ideally, or originally, they had their own way to basically uh, uh, organize and structure the data. So a vendor, say Schlumberger or Baker Hughes or Ali Barton or you name it, structured the data in their own way for their own application. And then Shell, BP, Sharon, if they wanted to get those data, they had either to convert the data in their own structure system or they just couldn't process them. So imagine the frustration, the level of effort and resources that was wasted because everybody was speaking a different language in terms of data. So there was no way to liberate the data across the parties involved in the drilling procedures. We have, again, massive amount of instrumentation on the reef, And each instrument is basically providing data continuously. So again, the sheer volume of data is enormous, and especially if you consider the high frequency of this data. Imagine having months worth of drilling data from all sorts of instruments and from all sorts of parameters. Like you have months of information from mud flow in, mud flow out, pit volume, hook load, RPM, ROP. There are so many mnemonics we monitor while drilling, and that causes so much data that really screams for a standardization that everybody agrees on so that we can process them. Right now, we did 
managed to find a solution for all of this. And yet, I can tell you there is one thing that we couldn't find agreement with yet between the players in the industry is to name what we manage in a standard way. You will be surprised how many, in how many ways, for example, map flowing average is named, depending on the vendor that is measured. So mnemonic aggregation is another thing we want to work on. And you know, domain expertise, in this case drilling, but again, it can be applied to production reserve, but it's very important because it's only through our feedback that we can improve what very smart programmers have put together to standardize the way we exchange this data. So again, before the 80s, that's what was happening. Even right now, when you write your own program to calculate you know, something that you're interested in or an application, the easiest way to write the program is to consume data that will actually that have a structure that fit exactly that application. So you basically have data structure uh, in a way that is fit for purpose. So if for any reason you get different type of data, your application will not work. And that's how it was basically uh, happening throughout these years before the 80s and still sometimes right now. We have applications that can read data only if they are in a certain format and you basically are locked in. There is no way you can, you know, uh, use that application in different environments. So say you have wrote an application that process daily uh, production volumes. But your data has to come in a certain structure, otherwise your uh, program will not work. And you didn't agree on that structure with anyone else. You just decided yourself because that was the easiest way. What happens if Chevron wants to buy or BP or Shell? They will have different data. And the first thing they would need to do is to either way feed their data to your application or change your application to consume their data. And so that's already an extra cost. And if, for example, they want to do this for one well, the effort is, let's say, a certain percentage of effort. What if they want to scale it to uh, hundreds of wells across the world where standards are different, even in terms of units of measure? Then basically, scalability and support of such a, an application built on a fit-for-purpose data structure is basically not going to apply. So again, there is a need for a standardization of our data. And that's where, finally, the industry sat together and said, okay, now we need to find an agreement and we need to build a data exchange standard that will help us consume the data, that will help us to consume the data regardless of where the data are coming from, meaning regardless from the vendor or operator or contractor that is uh, measuring or producing those data, and so that we will not speak different languages anymore. We want to speak all the same language. We want to find an agreement. And so that's what the data exchange standard that for started in the 80s. And it was basically built on two main concepts, the interoperability and interchangeability. Interoperability means that we want to be able across different line of businesses on, in a, an operator, for example, to be able to process the data and consume the data regardless. But also we want to be able to exchange this data within our company for different applications, but also outside of our company with the other players. So how do we achieve that? Well, first of all, we need a single data schema. Data schema is extremely important. We will see how this is achieved. So data schema are the basis. If our data do not comply to the data schema that everybody agreed on, they won't be ingested. They are an exception and they will be unacceptable. And that's how you have to do the things. If you want a standardized way, you need, first of all, to agree on a data schema. Everything needs to be explicitly defined. There is no implicit anymore. I do not have to implicitly assume that everybody will know the data from the GOM are coming in field units. That's not the case. I need to specifically and explicitly mention everything. All the labeling needs to be clear, both in the actual data and in the related metadata. As I mentioned, the standards need to be vendor, application, and operator agnostic. So there is no uh, difference if data are coming from Schlumberger, Ali Barton, or uh, Baker Hughes, they will be equally able to be read by Shell, BP, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, it's you name it. The standards need to be stable, of course. They need to be continuous. There needs to be continuity. What does it mean is that this standard needs to be durable in time. So 20 years from now, the standard needs to be still there, still viable, and still valid. 
and they need to allow for different level of digital sophistication. For example, if I am trying to ingest and exchange well and well board headers, they are simple. They don't need a great level of sophistication. But if I'm trying to provide a schema for time logs or depth logs or trajectory objects or mud logs, mud data, then you need a better or a higher level of sophistication. So you need to have a way to scale the digital sophistication of these data standards. They need to be universal. Again, we are dealing with upstream and downstream oil and gas. It's extremely diverse. They need to be applicable everywhere in our industry. So these are the main concepts. And of course, this needs to be coupled with standard development kits. We call them SDK. And SDKs are available for any companies that is building a software that provides some sort of open source package. They call it an SDK. It's basically, again, an open source uh, set of uh, functions and tools for developers that basically are based on mature formats in this case. Again, for continuity, we need to provide something that is durable in time. XML, which stands for Extensible Markup Language and JSON, formats are the one that we use for real-time drilling data and not only drilling data. We will see the same applies for reservoir and production when it comes to uh, this type of standards. These formats are assumed, and uh, I don't have any reason to disagree, that they will be long-standing. You know, in engineering, when we talk about engineering technology, like, for example, simple things like the API filtration press instrument that we have in the field, the Marsh Funnel, they've been around for almost a century, and they're still there. When it comes to programming, long-standing can have a relative meaning. Not that long ago, we were all coding in MATLAB. Before that, in Fortran. Right now, everything is done through Python or C Sharp. So we see there is a lot of changes that they didn't, uh, you know, this type of uh, work changes past. But we believe that XML and JSON files will stay for decades at least. And they will be format, the formats of reference for this data for a long time. We need to have, of course, a single development interface to read and write data. We need to be able to manage exceptions. So we need to control that everything we are writing conforms to the schemas that we have defined. And again, there must be no implicit context. So that being said, in the 80s, the industry came up with the Well uh, Info Transfer Service, which these were originally meant to transfer information from offshore to onshore facilities. But then to make this even more far reaching, they added the XML format, which stands again for extensible markup language, and they finally came up with the WITSML standard, which again stands for well information, transfer service, markup language. Now we will dive through this a little bit more into the details. So according to Energetics, which is right now the neutral party that is owning these standards, they say that a global industry-wide set of freely available and vendor neutral technical data exchange standards for key data along the entire exploration and production value chain can solve this data and compatibility problem. And that's how they came up with these three, I would say, products or standards. The WITSMF, which applies to drilling, RESTQML, which applies to reservoir data, and product PRODML, which applies to production data. That's why I'm saying that the things that we will see today Although they seem drilling specific, they literally apply across the whole industry. As I mentioned, we started from WITS for offshore to onshore exchange of the transmission of data. Adding the XML format, we now can cover all sorts of aspects, and not just drilling, but also cementing, completion, phasing, coring, logging while drilling, measuring while drilling. We can move this data across applications or across repository of data. And again, they allow us to store them for a long time. And again, historical data have a tremendous value. Imagine how, man, how many machine learning models you can trade if you have access to 30 plus years of data. That's why we need to find a way, and they did, to make this data accessible, no matter if we are sitting in the Houston office of BP, or if we are sitting in South Campus. If we have access to the server, we should be able, by simply studying the uh, energetic standards, to get those data and start processing them. And that's actually how it works. 
so I mentioned that the main base of XML data is XML. XML is a, again, stands for extensible markup language, and it's based on the XML document object model. There are three strong points about XML. The first one is that they are independent of the sort software or hard of, of hardware or hardware tools. So they basically can be stored and transported regardless. They are both human and machine readable. Mm. And I will show you why that's true. And they can be extended or they are extensible to any number of additions. So you can keep continuously add sophistication. And that goes back to one of the needs that we discussed, continuity in terms of adding different level of digital sophistication. So this is how a schematic of an XML document looks like. And that's why it is really easy to read by a human as well as a machine. You always start with a root element. Say we want to describe the inventory of a bookstore. So you have your root element, which is the bookstore. And then you start having child elements. So the root, the root element is the parent. And then you have sub elements, which are the child. In this case, will be the book and the category. So each sub child will have an app. Of course, you can continue adding level of sophistication. You have a book, OK. You have sub elements. What is the title, the author, the year, and the price? And each of these will have an attribute that can be either, each attribute will have a value that can be either a string, a number, like a double, or a timestamp if it is a date. So regardless, you can always associate to each element an attribute, and each attribute will have a value. And that's how you basically keep building different level of sophistication. <clears throat> So this is how it looks like from a human point of view, and this is from a machine readable point of view. Let's say we are trying to catalog CD-ROMs. So you have the root element, which is the catalog, and then you start having the first sub-element in the main child, which is CD, and the attributes are title, artist, country, company, price, and year. And each of these attributes will have a value. So this is a very simple structure of an XML, but this is no difference on how we do, for example, uh, or how we code in XML format, web or headers or well headers. They will have the main child or the main subparent, which is the class, which is well. And then we will see each well will have different attributes, the well name, the well unique identity, the well unique identification number, the um, time zone basically that relates to the location of the well and so on and so forth and we will see how that is actually looking like so xml we have seen an overview of what those are about how do they reflect in our witzml standard they provide the base for that they require some constraints again if we want a standard we need to constrain our data they need to follow the grammatical rules governing the order of the elements and these grammatical rules are fixed and decided upon. So everything needs to fit these standards. XML generally have Boolean predicates that needs to be satisfied. And I will show you an example of that. The data types that are governing the content and related attributes is an important thing. So for each data type, I will have certain attributes that have certain content. And finally, each of the schemas for each of the object needs to be unique. There shouldn't be any ambiguity. Once these main rules are set, each data type, each file is valid only if it conforms to the data schema. So if I'm writing, for example, a well header, like so, and I'm not providing the name, like I literally skip to add this attribute, or I do not follow the same naming, then this will not be read. It will not be written to the Witsamal store. And that's actually a very important thing, this exception management, because if I keep adding things the way I like it, then I lose completely the standard. I revert back to the same chaos that was before. And so the whole universality of these data standards is lost. And so you have seen that this looks like very similar to our CD-ROM, the way we define it. We have the parent child, which is well, and then we have the attributes, the well unique identifier, which is always there. So when you query for wells using WITSML, when you tap into a WITSML store, you don't look for names. I can literally tell you there are more than, I would say more than 50 wells in Dom that are named A1 or A01. Naming for well, book well and well board is completely 
unpredictable and it's not reliable at all. If you want to look for a well in a very unique and, un and without ambiguity, you always refer to the well UID if you're using with some help. Then, of course, you have attributes, attributes like time zone, and then you start having metadata such as the creation time of this node and when it was last modified. And these are also very important because these we can track changes on whatever it's in the store. The same applies for the web or node. It's a little bit more complicated, but one thing that I wanted to show you is the Boolean predicates that I mentioned here. So Boolean predicates are basically, you are saying if something is true or false. So in this case, the attribute is, is this web or active? Meaning, do we still get time? Do we still get data associated to this web or of any sort? If we have false, that means that there is no more trading happening, that the well, the well will reach TD, so it's a total death. And we can assume that the well board has been basically drilling and been completed for that well. And this is very important, especially if we are dealing with real-time data, we need to make sure we handle this type of situation. So we need to tell our application to stop pulling data if there is no more data available, otherwise it could keep running. So that being said, how about what we really are after, the actual data? Among the many data types that are available in, the, in a WinSML store, the one that we generally look for as drilling engineer are log time data, where we have basically, or time logs, where we have, for example, recorded pit volume, map flow in, map flow out, hook load, ROP, RPM, surface store, weight of beat. So those are the things that we generally care for if we are doing, or if we are running any sorts of drilling analysis. Now, as I mentioned, XML provides different level of digital sophistication. You've seen how well header is simple, but what if we need to provide more information in a case of a, of a log? We need to have a standard that can be basically without limits extended to accommodate different level of digital sophistication. In this way, for example, and in here I just basically uh, took an example from Schlumberger. What we have here, a log, is generally starting as the type, which is the parent, basically, or the sub-parent. So we have logs. This is the type of data we're looking at. As you see, when you look at these headers, we have that even logs have your unique identity type. Each log is associated to one well, well UID, and one well board. Of course, if you're familiar with drilling, if you have a well, you can have multiple well boards associated. <laughs> So it's important that you specify not just the well, but also the well board. And if you do not do it, then you cannot read the log. So in this case, we are asking, if we do query for just this, you will basically ask to pull all the curves associated to this log UID that is associated with this well and this well board. So the first thing you see, if you look at the XML schema for this, for logs in general, you have a main header, which stores all the information, all the attributes. The name of the web to which it is associated, the name of the web board, the name of the log. So you see this log is actually a time log that is coming from the run number nine for the section uh, 8.5 inches. This is another Boolean predicate. Is this object growing? Meaning, do we still get data? Or basically, we are done collecting data for this log. In this case, it's false, it's only static, so there is no more real time coming in. Which company is this log belonging to, or who provided this measurement? That's Schumberger. The run number, of course, for the PHA run, it's an important information that we need. That's from the run number nine, in conformity to what we see on the name. We have the creation date, and this is very important. It also tells us what, how this log is indexed. And I have assumed that this is a time log because it says like that in the name, and so it is. In fact. The index that we use for this log is time, but logs can be indexed by that as well. For instance, when you're uh, collecting, uh, for example, uh, uh, seismic logs, those are generally depth based They are not time-based. And so on and so forth. Then, once we have the main information for the log, then it starts telling us which curves are associated with that log. Generally, one log has several curves. So if you're looking at, for example, uh, logs that are measuring uh, 
something related with our drilling fluids, we generally see the mud flow in and out. We generally see the peak volumes associated with that. We generally see gas readings. So we have multiple curves associated with one with, with one load. In this case, I just showed the first one where we may have multiple. So after the header, we have the actual curve information. So it's telling us that the curve ID, so everything has a unique ID in which it's not standard. And that's how you get things uniquely. There is no ambiguity. Everything is explicitly defined. Remember what we said at the beginning. The important is that everything is explicitly defined. So we have a UID. We have the way this mnemonic is called. We have the description. This is actually accumulated by volume. We have the units. This is extremely important. Units is always a mess in our industry. Everybody uses the industry that they, the unit that they prefer. Again, GOM use field data, uh, field units. North Sea use standard units in the same operator. So imagine what's the confusion that can arise if you don't set some standards, even within one operator, not even in the whole industry. And then you have all other attributes, right? And then finally, you have the data, the log data. And this is telling us what type of data do we are we dealing with? Are they strings, meaning like uh, text information? Are they dates, like timestamps, or double, meaning like actual numbers? In this case, we will have the log curve info. And then after this, you will have the other curves, stuff one after another. And finally, you have how the actual log data looks like. And I said these are time-based, so you have the first measurement, then the second, the third, and so on and so forth for all the curves. Another good thing that this curve, this uh, curve information brings is the minimum and maximum time of the log. So basically, it's telling us the extension of the log. So this is basically about five hours, six hours worth of data. So if you are basically querying for this specific mnemonic, but you don't want all the data, you just want, because you know something happened at a certain time, you can actually specify in your query that you want the data associated to this curve in between a certain time frame, and that's what you will get. So see how easier our life gets and what we can do as engineers once we understand how to process this data. So again, this is not a computer science and I am not the right person to go through this in even more detail. But if you get the understanding of how to use this information, that as an engineer, you can actually make really cool things out of this. So again, how do we get this data? So how, how we move from the different sources to the Witsemel store and finally to our lab? So what we based on is the energetic transfer protocol. They provide all the details on how to basically process this data. And you can write a, your own Python interface based on ETP. And this will actually give you a query. You can build your own query to basically get the data. So again, the first thing when you build your own uh, query is you need to connect to the WITSML server. You need to initiate what we call as the SOAP, which is the simple object access protocol. It's basically what allows you to exchange XML uh, data through HTTP. Because again, all these data are not stored in anything, you know, not in a flash drive. We do not get data in flash drive. These are all stored in cloud servers, whether it's AWS, Azure, or G, uh, GC, GCS, basically Microsoft, Amazon, and Google. So we need to have some sort of way to transfer data to the HTTP, and that's the solution. So you initiate that. You define the way you want to process the XML based on the WITSML version. So there are a couple of versions. The last one is 4.1.4.1.1. Between version, there is not much difference, but it's good to know because sometimes they change a little thing and then your processing actually breaks. So you need to be sure that you know the version. And then you can create your query. So the good thing is, once you define this, you can basically get XML data. You can convert them to JSON and then use any you know, Python library, mostly pandas, which has definitely a quick function that converts JSON to data frame. And there you go, you have structured data and you can start playing with that. So let me show you quickly how an example looks like. This is what I have as a general, let's say, does it open? No. Let me see if I can open it with probably text file because Generally, I use Sublime to show. Uh, so I'm not going through this too much, but I just want to show you that basically the first thing I did in here 
is and this is actually sorry the wrong one it was this one those will come later there you go so the first thing you do as i mentioned you initiate your connection and you start calling for the soft service so again we are not going through this but this is just to show you how a structure in python looks like so you have a class that i call with some in object oriented program in each class has functions that you can call of course we Functions in when you define a class are called methods, so each class has its own methods. And first of all, you start initiating your connection to server, you check the versions, you initiate the soap calls, and then once you do this part, which is taken care of in these first four functions, this is where the interesting part that concerns us starts. You basically start building your own queries, for example, get wells. So I'm building these functions that needs only the well UAD. And sometimes if I want to be to give it a well status. And basically I can start pulling and collecting all the wells that have the certain UI. And of course, this can be one well or can be a list of wells. And that's why I put status here, because perhaps I'm interested only in the active one. So again, you call your soap, which you initiated previously. You collect the headers information, you collect the body with all the data, and then you process basically your XML. And as I mentioned, the last step is to create a JSON format from XML. And once this is done, you have a JSON format that you can easily transform when you're processing script to a data frame using Pandas or whatever other library you are after, and you can start playing with the data. So this one gives you, for example, the wells. This query gives you the well bores. It's very similar. So there is not any difference beside a couple of changes. This one gives you all the logs. So look what happens here. It's basically telling me, OK, I give you the well UID. So for a second well, and if I want, I give you the well work, returns all the logs associated with it. So here, I'm not even querying or parsing through the logs. I'm just asking, give me all the logs. So I will get the headers and the actual data of the logs. But what if I want, for example, a little bit more specific query? Then I build a query that actually, and this is pretty cool, and I mentioned before, you can query for logs, whether they are time-based or depth-based. You can tell, give me all the logs for this well and well board. I actually tell you which log I want, because I provide the UID. And among that log, I'm telling you which curves I want. So I want this mnemonic or a bunch of them. I want them when, if I want them when basically index from a certain value to another value, whether it's that or I can tell you I want those data in a certain time frame. That's what I said before. So for example, I want uh, RPM data for a certain whiteboard starting from December 26th to January 15th. And that's what it's get, what it's getting. Because probably in that time we had an issue and I want to analyze what happened. And I can run this whether I'm sitting here in North, uh, South Frankfurt or in Houston for any operator or the operator that I basically developed this while I was there. So these are just general queries, of course. They don't have any proprietary. I didn't put anything there that may, you know, may link to anything. But the thing is, the power of this is that you can access this data anywhere, anytime, as long as you have access. So that being said, I'll go through a couple of applications. One thing that I should mention is, the way this run in the native system of the operator, of course, I cannot show you. I don't have access to that anymore. But <coughs> I can actually show you the base behind the engineering base, how we couple this with real-time data. And in a way, I can show you how the final results looks like, whether in a different plot or somehow trying my best to replicate what, what happened originally. So the first thing, how do we get value from real-time data is if we want to diagnose well board breathing. So well board breathing is under the category of well control. It's actually a pretty complex thing to uh, detect because of the fact that not many people are actually aware that this is happening. And most of the time, when an influx or a suspect, so suspicious influx occurs, the first thing that everybody thinks is this is a key. They shut in the well, and that's fine. But then they run 
uh, well controlled practices sometimes are necessary and they cause even more damage. So this is how a brief, when we're breathing phenomenon occurs. So when we drill, we are basically circulating and our wellbore pressure is basically a dynamic condition. So we have the wellbore pressure equal to the hydrostatic head of the map plus the frictional losses in the system. That pressure sometimes, if we have a narrow margin of the mud width, may actually cause microfractures in the perform into the formation or can actually open already fractures present in the system that have a limited extent. So they do not, they are not major fractures. Because of this phenomenon, we are charging basically the fractures that we are encountering. And once we stop circulation, what happens is our level pressure drops to the static condition. The mud in the fracture basically gets discharged. One thing that I should mention is that in breathing, it has been recognized that leak off into the formation is very minimal because of the time frame and the, in, and the internal market that basically builds at the walls of the fracture. So that we don't have migration of mud or excessive migration of mud into the formation. So most of the fluid leak is retaining the fractures until it is discharged back into the wellbore. And what happens is that we basically see an influx back to the surface that gradually stabilizes and ends it and ends with time. The thing is, once we see an influx, we assume the worst and then we just shut it. And so the, this is what wellbore breathing basically looks like as a, in a schematic or a general way. And this is what happens if we are monitoring real time data. For example, we have the pump rate, so we are circulating, then we stop for a connection. And in normal situation, what we expect is that the mud wave will basically go to the static condition. So from ECD to ESD. What happens though is that if we have a if we have wellbore breathing, we are basically having unexpected circulation into the, into the system. If we have circulation, we have pressure drops. So we don't have a direct drop of the mud wave like literally instantaneous to the static condition, but it's kind of like gradual because we are adding frictional losses to the system. But eventually what we expect in those situations is to have a mud wave equal to this. If we have an influx though, what we see is that the mud wave keeps decreasing because we are lowering the density of the mud because reservoir fluid is entering the system. But that being said, what makes kick and breathing look similar is that they are both preceded by drilling fluid losses. They have a very similar time frame. They are very fast pressure driven uh, processes. The pumps off profile of the, uh, basically of the flow rate and peak looks quite similar. And the gas cut in the bottom up is actually something that we observe in breathing as well, because some gas may migrate into the mud when we have it in the fractures, when it is stored into the fracture. So what happens is this represents a safety hazard and a level of stability. Safety in the sense that if we treat uh, a kick as if it was breathing, what we do is, first of all, we decrease the mud weight, we unlock the well, and that just increases the severity of the leak. On the other hand, if we kill a breathing well, we increase the mud weight, we generate even more charging of the fractures until we move from uh, basically uh, reversible losses to total losses, and that's a well worth stability situation due to unnecessary well control fractures. So, how do we plan to diagnose this, we have built a model in QRP. I will not go through the details of the model. We will just look at how the diagnostic curves look like, how they work, and then we will see how XML data have been used for a confirmed breathing situation that was diagnosed and a kick that was actually had to be diagnosed thanks to this protocol. I'm just going to mention that this model is based on a is a geomechanical model that couples deformation and fluid flow in a double porosity single permeability system. Now, double porosity means that we are assuming that both pores and fractures are equally continuously distributed in our system, but only one phase is mobile, which is fractures. Flow, flow flows only to the fractures for this time frame. Pores are actually just a storage space. This is, again, a reasonable assumption considering that we don't have major leak off into the formation for that time frame. And this helps us actually solve some of the issues that we have encountered with double porosity, double permeability system, especially in the boundary condition at the well board. This was noticed by Dr. Kuchuk and his co-authors. And by assuming this, we have solved that uh, problem. We need to correctly <laughs> size our reference elementary volume. For example, 
if we decide, if we size our RAD too small, then assuming the fractures are continuously distributed is not right. If we size it too large, reservoir scale, then what happens is we are assuming that all the fractures in the reservoir have homogeneous property, which is not the case, especially if you have carbon formations. But if we size it in length as the open hole section and as in uh, radius, radially, as the size of the damage radius, then we actually have a consistent RED for this system. And of course, fracture needs to be hydraulically connected to each other and to the whiteboard to actually have brief proper. And for the coupling, we have used the Berryman and one constitutive motor, which I'm not going into the detail, but just mentioning. So the flow solution for this coupled problem for an entire whiteboard looks like this. Although we have series and uh, vessel function involved, this is actually an analytical solution. And although again, we have series, and this variable here is called the ample variable. You have to find it by solving a linear combination of vessels function. But I can assure you that although it seems convoluted, it actually converges really fast because it's an analytical solution. And that allows us to build tight curves extremely fast. And tight curves are well bore radius dependent. So the thing is, if we can build them fast, we can apply this for any situation without running uh, time consuming numerical computation. That may be more accurate if we are after quantitative measurement. But for qualitative trend matching, analytical solution are, we thought that this was the best way to go. So based on this flow solution of flow rate and cumulated volume that is basically coming outside of the, uh, from the fracture back to the level. So we're looking at the flow back, define this dimensional group, a dimensional flow rate, dimensional volume. And then of course, this is a, a function of the system properties, and in here it's just a function of uh, uh, basically algebraic uh, variables. So the dimensional volume, if we take the logarithmic derivative, we have this corrected flow rate, which has the same units as the volume group. So we can plot them in the same graph. And this is all borrowed by well testing concepts. So it's nothing new to the oil industry. We just use best practice in well testing and apply it to diagnose well -building. And then we take the ratio of these two groups to actually guarantee uniqueness of the mesh. And so with the volume groups and the time group, we can finally build our type curves. So type curves are well bore radius dependent. So this one is for an eight and a half inch bore For other sizes, we need to build other type curves. But again, it's a very quick process thanks to the analytical solution. And each curve, in this case, the continuous curve are the volume group. The dash one has the volume derivative, and this is the ratio. And this is for different damage values. So the point here is how do we use width cement and these type curves to diagnose what we're treating? So the first thing we did is we built a width cement query, which I put here, but for time constraint, I'm not going through it, but it just uses the function that we have seen there. I just call get logs and I specify which logs I am after and which mnemonics I want. In this case, the only mnemonics I'm after is pit volume gate. That's the only thing I need. There is no other thing that is needed for this. Tool. I just need the pit volume time base. So I query that, generate the flow type curves. And this is done regardless of the data. And with the with some data, I process them, I take the numerical. I numerically differentiate them against the logarithm of time to obtain the volume group. And then I take the ratio. And then what I do to automate this is I take the first derivative of the type curve of the type curves and the field curves. And I run an algorithm, uh, basically uh, an algorithm that tries to find uh, the best match between the derivatives. If through this trend matching, I find an acceptable match between derivatives or trends, then I can diagnose breathing. And this is basically a case, and I'll show you how it looks like, not in the native system, but by just overlapping the curves. This was a gone well. They have noticed something suspicious with the pit volume. And this was the longest stop of situation. So we decided to analyze this situation where you can see the flow out is basically zero as well as the flow. In. And in this case, we are, I've also reported the standby pressure 
Because what they did is, after that, they didn't know if that was written or not. They studied the weather. And look at what happened. The shutting pressure remained constant at about 200 PSI weeks. But no surprise, it was actually the difference between ECD and ESC. So there was already a, a clue that that was not. That being said, we ran the tool. And we basically, this is the peak volume gain that I pulled from this. And then we run it in this case because we know that after 900, at the 900 minutes, we restarted circulation. So this was the no circulation point where we received this influx that stabilized a little. So the peak volume increased and then kind of stabilized. And you can see how it was preceded by fluid losses. So we had a negative peak volume. And that's what happened. So it, a decent match was found for this set of curves for this specific damage radius, which was not important for diagnostic purposes, but you can see how a unique match was found between one group of curves belonging to the same damage radius. So we have the trend of the volume groups following exactly the one of the factors. So the blue curve is the peak volume, volume derivative, or better, the corrected volume derivative, and the ratio. And because of that, we report that this is actually Breathing according to the model, and so it was confirmed. So the protocol was actually, was actually to prevent, to apply any well control practices, and we proceeded trailing safely, and we kind of saw that. In another situation, we ran the same for a different well in North Sea, but look what happened in this case. When we used this tool, no match was found, and look at what happened. At the early time, the match was good, but then later on, the volume group started deviating from the type group, and so did the, the, the corrected flow rate, and the ratio started going down rather than up. And this is the classical signature that a kick actually carries along. And so we actually said, no, this is not breathing. This is a kick. You need to actually take care of that. And so it was confirmed. So we can do a lot of things, and we can reduce non-productive time if we make best use of WITSML data and engineering knowledge. Now, very quickly, I'll go through another example. Micro -dogger. So when we do grid, we always try to measure how the trajectory is perceived. How we do that, we take surveys and we calculate the trajectories. The trajectory. Uh, one of the output of the trajectory is the Doppler or Doppler severity, which is an indication of the whole curvature. What happens is we do take trajectories basically between 100 feet about distance. So what happens is we have stations that are quite far from each other. We don't know what is happening in between. So look at this, for example. We have continuous reading of inclination for two different wells. The green light is continuous. The black dots are the survey. The purple one is continuous. The red one are the survey. Uh, the survey inclination. Look at what happens here, for, for example, in this case. Surveys tell us that the inclination is increasing, but in reality, the continuous one are actually showing us that there was a drop in inclination between the circuit. And same here. So what is happening? We didn't even catch this. But if we have a different inclination, we most likely have a different azimuth than what we expect, which leads to a different problem. And that's what happened. Micro doglet are all those continuous doglet that we cannot see between the station. And if we have a too high micro doglet, that means a high hole curvature, which can cause casing damages. And I mentioned before, and we will see what that means. So the technology that we built was meant to, in real time, return micro doggate measurement using continuous inclination analysis and return an alarm if that was larger than we expected from the service. And what we addressed is that we can actually provide real time control over the trajectory in a continuous way, not just survey or station based. We can actually calculate the doglet using the minimum curvature method, and we can provide a continuous measurement of it. And if we diligently use this tool, we can actually reduce the risk of, the risk of casing failure due to undealt or unnoticed abnormal or curvature, or even like a tight spot or stuck pipe for that matter. Not just, not just that. And I here I attach the query uh, that of, because of time we will not go through, but I'll just show you what happened here. So this is basically showing a general situation where you have a higher curvature measured to be in this case by gyro tool. And this shows you shows you what happens when you have contact at the casing and a high curvature. You can see clearly that you have a rapid change in direction and a following increase 
in the local forces at the contact point. So if you have a high side force, meaning at the contact point between string and casing, you have a high side force, you are rotating the pipe, you are creating potentially so much heat that again, you may cause thermal stresses on the casing. And if you do not exchange that heat efficiently, then what happens is you will, act, you will generate uh, thermal stresses potential cracks of the casing and casing failure, or basically you will damage the casing integrity. So this is when we run the tool. We saw that everything looked fairly okay in terms of inclination. Everything seemed to be pretty close. What we didn't like was the behavior of the azimuth. There was quite a difference, especially in this play, in this case, and also I'll, towards the end of the hole, the azimuth yeah. actually from continuous measurement was slightly higher. And this is what happened in that section. What we noticed is that microdome, which is the blue dots, were definitely higher than the measured dome. So you see, of course, the continuous measurement of microdome is has a higher frequency than the um, survey dome. So in this case, we had a risk of a tight spot because of a higher than expected hole curvature, and that's exactly what happened. At 19,500 uh, 19, feet, the relative higher microdomia than the survey data was the cause of the tight spot. And actually, they also measured higher than normal vibration. So again, this actually showed us that, oops, did actually showed us that there is a strong value in uh, leveraging real-time data when we take engineering decisions. So my recommendation is, although this may look kind of different from what you are used to see, or if you never dealt with uh, you know these type of things, I never did before myself, and I don't consider myself an expert, but at least I try to be part of this world that is offering these tools. And if you are able to at least scratch the surfaces of this tool, you can make really interesting tools out of it. So I hope this was of interest and sorry if I took longer than expected. Questions? Actually, I have two of them. One is the last one that you showed, which is I'm trying to understand why, why there's a difference between the Survey data and continuous data, which continuous is a measurement as well, right? Yeah. And, and survey is also a measurement. Yes. Is there any other tool used, you know, for that, or are they the sources are different or, or not? I mean, wh why is there a difference? I'm trying to get that. The difference is uh, mainly not in uh, because the thing is when we do run survey data, for example, in this case, let me show this case, like survey data, which is basically the red. The red points, they do agree most of the time with the continuous data when we map them. <clears throat> the problem is the difference is not when we have survey points. Those actually we have generally good match. The problem is when we don't have them. So it's not that like the measurement is different, it's more like in between stations, we don't have any survey data. So we are we are generating that data. exactly continuous is not measurement. No, no, they are measurement. Like for example, in this case, this probably shows better. Can you see the red dots in here? So the red dots are the survey data from stations. And you know the purple curve is the continuous one, and we have agreement between them. Whenever we have a continuous data and a survey data, they match. They have to match. The problem is in between. So in between, we don't have any data from those survey stations, but we have the continuous measurement that we have measured. And in between, we noticed that there was a problem that survey station couldn't catch because they are simply run at too far apart from each other. So the accelerometer and magnetometer are sending data continuously. Correct. Right? Yeah. So what what tool are you using? Like a wireline or something is used for that? I wasn't familiar. I mean, I didn't investigate with exactly the technology they use for the measurement of continuous uh, inclination and okay. We are just tapping to the data. Okay. But the thing is, maybe wired pipe or something. Yeah, it's exactly. possible that they were using those sorts of. Uh, so, so generally, what we do is also plot if we have the gyro data, which in this case we did not for the data I just showed. But the, the, the main point here is that 
Of course, when we do have both, they do match. They have right. But the problem is that when we don't have survey data and we have continuous data, if they do not match, it means that we didn't catch any. We, 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 we couldn't catch this change for the simple reason that the frequency at which we take two test stations was too high. Sorry, too high. Yeah, too. So it is just a difference between high frequency and low frequency. Correct. Yes. And the thing is, and that's the main problem generally with surveys, is that we do take them every time we, uh, basically, it's about the spend, right? If I'm not wrong. So, generally we have uh, about uh, 90 feet apart, 100 feet apart between stations. So everything that we didn't catch in those 100 feet may actually bring to some issues if there was any change or any sudden change in the whole group, which is sometimes the case. Like in this case, it was clearly something happened in this second section. Section number two, the continuous inclination showed that the inclination was actually it had a drop that we couldn't catch when we were using just the uh, survey stations. And this is reflected at the end into micro objects in between that we couldn't catch. And the other question I have was related to the first part of the presentation, which is that how different is it? Uh, from the process I'm talking about, it's, it's from the um, like, I mean, data scrapping from web or data mining from a web. Because what I understand is you're using it, you know, like salt is usually used for that particular purpose, and you have a JSON, you know, format uh, which is for accessing the data, you know, required data, and you're converting into XML format or so. I mean, more or less, when you're looking for something in, on the web that you don't exactly know what you're doing, that's more or less a similar type of process is going. I mean, how, what, di how different that is? <clears throat> there is, of course, a similarity with that, and the whole point of the effort that they bestowed on putting together the XML standard was to generate something that works already, formats that are mature, like XML. As you said, we do exchange XML, XML data through HTTP, we have you know protocols that are in place that are mature, and they wanted to leverage that to have a way to uh, basically circulate drilling data in a standard way between uh, between uh, the different parties involved. So we have based or they have based with some standards on something that was already mature and working. The main difference is that in here we are dealing with a certain type of data that requires a certain standardization, and to do that again. They leverage a format that is already in use, and you can find similarities, as you mentioned, in daily operation like we run on the web. Uh, I have some questions. Yeah. So, the study you conducted in the first part it was uh, studying the logs, uh, coming up with an analytical solution, and implementing it in the Python code, so you can determine whether the it's well, uh, whether we're breathing or in the kick. And you showed us the examples, but what about the real time application and drilling operations? Yeah. Will it be conducted or you plan as a part of the future, like future so project it, or something? You mean the way we have implemented it in real time? Because I want, uh, well, because the company, they have like software and they were working with this exactly. Their software, they were giving them real time operation information. Yeah. So they always were seeing their operation on the computer and they always see their market levels. Yeah. They uh, had research projects uh, by using artificial intelligence to determine kicks and different problems associated with these kicks. And as I see, like this is a really good approach, but are you planning to use it in the future in something? Well, okay, the code you mentioned, what they do, what you have seen there is exactly what we have seen at the beginning. Like they are leveraging the fact that now we have access to real-time data, so they can monitor everything that is happening. So if you have real-time data, you can build all sorts of, uh, basically, uh, like you mentioned, machine learning tools that can be used for early kick detection, for example. Uh, this tool doesn't try to predict kicks because it's based on a totally different phenomenon. But what I'm, what this can be done in terms of key diagnosis to be used together with a early key detection to basically 
have the tools identify less false alarm because most of these early heat detection tools they actually detect uh, well for breathing as heat because they do not see they are not trained against this type of data and that's one thing that we tried to do uh, in the past there was one effort of a company or of a contractor that worked on uh, early heat detection there is a nice paper about that and the problem was web of breathing the tool kept saying that there was a kick when uh, in fact there was not and we showed it with this tool so i don't know if anyone took that effort to implement these changes but it's something that i guess they are thinking of my question i'm going to piggyback off of your question uh, so I guess, you know, in the flowchart that starts with query. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I, I guess maybe one way to think of this is um, uh, that in a real-time setting, you basically repeat the loop, right? Yes. You get more data, you do another query, you repeat the algorithm. Yes. Uh, a big, you know, maybe this has changed uh, since, uh, you know, I worked with uh, XML. Uh, the query time, so you're querying a large tree, query time, you know, can be significant. Yeah. If you're looking for data at the bottom of a very tall tree, let's say you're looking at n entries, if you have direct, if the data base is just those n entries, the query cost might be n. But in a big tree, it's n log n, where m is the depth of the tree. Yeah. And so in a real time, you know, it's nice that there are standard parsers, uh, you know, uh, search algorithms on XML trees, but then the disadvantage is time, you know. It is. So I wonder uh, what percentage of your execution time, of your algorithm, uh, was spent on querying the database versus comparing the type Actually, that is a very good point. As a matter of fact, when you are dealing with this type of data, the querying does take time. But the way we have approached that in terms to reduce the time is that what we do, we try to uh, basically uh, query less amount of data. So let me show you what we did. Exactly. So uh, we, make, we, we basically took advantage. Let me see if this one. Uh, but, but before you do that, that, that's kind of where I was thinking you would answer. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, so okay. I tell you from my experience uh, in a previous you know, world, yeah. uh, because it was faster to work with like smaller subsets of the data and do algorithms, what people started doing was ignoring, like pulling it out of the big database and then sharing amongst themselves the, the reduced you know, versions bypassing the whole stack. Well, and it became everybody yeah. doing that. That's that's you what know? I that's what we need to bypass that. So I mean, uh, if you want, I can pull it out. But that's the basics. So what we do is we make use of. I don't know if you've ever used it, like MongoDB. It's basically you can build a dynamic database. So we were we started pulling information, and every time we pull a certain amount of information, we store it in the database. And then we when we update the query, we start from the last update, the, the last right. query Very point. Fresh. So we do not just focus on one portion because we keep that appending everything into the MongoDB. Database. So what started happening is people tapping into that, yeah. but one person needing a refresh and the other one not, you know? Yeah, and it does. because yeah. queries are, are expensive. It They're is. on a tree. That's the big shortcoming, I think. It know, is. These ginormous, it you is. know, standards. There is one way to bypass that. I know that they are working on it. They are converting all the soft calls to .NET, and that increased dramatically the, the time on query. So, but I didn't know that. I don't know the details, but I know they are working on that. On the tool. Yeah. Uh, that's wrong, Brandon. Uh, Wismel is a real good job, and uh, because I, I did meet some problems about the different formats from the different software. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, the, how do you first place the, the other software company to use the Wismail? Huh, that's, a, that's a really good question. It's more like marketing, because uh, I mean, you have a very good point. There are still some companies that do not 
have real time operation centers because all the ones that have, they generally uh, uh, contract other vendors, like I can name Comster, Intel, uh, to basically even Baker use right now to deal with the real time. Uh, Corva is one example as well that we company here in Houston. They are the ones that are XML certified and they can uh, basically provide a real time data monitor. The hard part is to convince a company on the other value that this can bring. And honestly, it's a hard job in the sense that if they couldn't see the, the, the value already, which is pretty obvious, as a matter of fact, I really don't know what else we can do to show them how important it is. I know a couple of companies that just started this uh, real-time operation control platform. Uh, and they are not small. They're actually not super major, but they are major, at least two. I can name. Uh, I don't have an answer for that. I don't know how we can. I mean, besides showing them the advantages, uh, it's hard really to, because uh, eventually they are they have a point. They've been drilling successfully so far. Why should they change? But the thing is, drilling successfully doesn't mean drilling sustainably. It doesn't mean you can do it better. It doesn't mean you cannot do it better. So that's a, it's a tough point. But yeah, you have a good point. Some still do not. But the soup, the, all the major ones, they do have it. And eventually everybody will follow. Or well, they should. Thank you. Well, so I have a question. Not, I don't understand most of the things you talked about. Okay, I have no expertise in drilling. But just like reservoir engineering, this is the time element is very short here, right? Because you're doing real time drilling, making decisions in real time. Yeah. How do you actually evaluate uncertainty? So, for example, breathing versus pick. Okay, I mean, I, I, if I understood you correctly, that you could see the same signature and the phenomena is different. How do you decipher the differences? And you, when you say you reach a certain conclusion, there's a possibility that because of the uncertainty, in the way you analyze the data, there could be a, a, an alternative to your conclusion. So symptom may be the same, but the uh, solution is different. How do you evaluate that uncertainty so quickly when you're making decisions in real time? Yeah, no, that is, a, that is an excellent point. Uh, the way we did specifically for this case is we run the tool, uh, as we call it as an offset tool for a uh, several times, we basically run uh, the tool on historical data that we already knew the answer. And that way we evaluated the percentage of false alarm and the versus like uh, uh, false positive and true positive, basically. So we run uh, some sort of uncertainty analysis in that sense. Does that address the uncertainty that a real time decision will always carry? I can say, I don't think it will, that it's gonna be always an uncertainty level, but the confidence that we have in the tool, it's higher if we have run an offset analysis first. So, so you're training the yes. process by earlier wells which have been drilled in yes. a similar amount. It's, uh, yeah, it's exactly a very similar approach on what they do with machine learning. They train a model against past data, training data, and if anything different happens and there is an uncertainty in that, then that becomes part of the training set. So in the future, if something with the same uh, behavior happens, then they they have a better output in that sense. So I don't think we can avoid uncertainty, but we can address it in terms of increasing confidence for the future. Yeah, that will be a lag time, but the idea is to minimize that as much as possible. Otherwise, uh, I mean, so when you're doing reservoir simulation, there's a lot of uncertainty, but you are you have the benefit of time, right? Because the, it's going to take a long time before you see a response. So it's okay, you could take another day, okay? But here, <laughs> you're drilling fast, and you say, oh, I think this is this must have happened, but maybe there's an uncertainty, and you made the wrong decision. So, right? But now that that's absolutely true. And actually, myself, I mentioned when we were using the tool, I said. No matter what the tool says, we shut in the well. But then we figure out whether we do run, we run well control practices or not. But the shut in is like no question. We will shut in. Like the uncertainty in that situations is 
But that's a cost, right? That's a cost. It is a cost. But uh, if we do apply well control practice that are not necessary, there will be even a bigger cost. So in a way, we address a part of the, but we do not take to any risks. So yeah, that's a very good point. Shutting is actually, in that particular situation, it's, uh, it's safety regulation. You have to do that. So that, uh, I mean, afterwards, if it's not a kit, but you treat it as a kit, is a non-productive time altogether, which is not desired. I mean, the answer from that one is, if that is not a kit, you identify it, and you're happy, because you save a lot of time. But that shutting trigger, uh, you cannot, I mean, you don't want, you don't want that one, because of safety regulations. More questions. All right. Well, if, yeah. One more. Or if not, uh, let's uh, give Sylvia another round. Thank you. Thank you.